last time on Journey to the West, the villainous Red Boy abducted Tripitaka and grievously wounded the indomitable Monkey King with his ultimate weapon, the True Fire of Samadhi. Injured and weak, but determined to retrieve his master, Sun Wukong petitioned the merciful Quan Yin for her aid, and the two of them hatched a plan to deceive the precocious monster. By way of illusions and an arsenal of blades, the divine duo defeated the demon, and Tripitaka was once more restored to his place in the Journey to the West. So our heroes are trekking westward, as they have been for quite some time now, and morale is honestly running a little low. Tripitak is getting homesick, and Pigsy laments that it feels like they'll be on this journey forever. <laughs> but just as Monkey is telling them to quit whining, because they'll get there when they get there, they bump into a huge, turbulent, and totally pitch-black river in their way. While they're discussing how to get across, they spot a boatman nearby and ask him to ferry them across. But the boat's too small to accommodate a monk, three semi-celestial monsters, and an entire horse, so they split up into two groups. Tripitaka and Pigsy to be ferried across first, Sandy and the horse next, and Monkey can just jump across, so it's not really an issue. But when Tripitaka and Pigsy are halfway across the river, the boatman reveals himself to be a bad guy, summoning a whirlwind and sinking the boat. Sandy panics and says they should look downstream to see if they've washed up on the shore, but Monkey points out that Pigsy's a good swimmer. If it were a normal capsizing, he should have been able to get himself in Tripitaka to safety, no problem. So Sandy strips down to dive in, but Monkey warns that the black water looks real suspicious. But Sandy points out he lived in a river way eviler than this one and heads in no problem. Investigation of the river bottom reveals a huge pavilion advertised as the home of the Black River God, and Sandy overhears the definitely not a real boatman monologuing about how he's gonna invite his uncle over so they can eat Tripitaka and become immortal. Sandy becomes enraged and bangs on the door, demanding Tripitaka's return. And Pigsy too, I guess. And the demon comes out to see what all the fuss is about. The demon's all decked out in gold and jewels, and is instantly down to fight. He and Sandy battle at the bottom of the river for a good 30 rounds before Sandy realizes they're at an impasse and turns to run, hoping to lure the demon out of the water so Monkey can finish him off. But the demon's got more pressing matters to attend, namely drafting up an invite for his uncle so he doesn't follow him to the surface. As Sandy and Monkey discuss what to do, a mysterious old man suddenly appears and introduces himself as the Black River God. He quickly clarifies that he's not the demon that abducted Tripitaka, he's the true god of this river. But several months ago, this demon stormed in from the Western Ocean, kicked him out of his house, and set up shop in his fancy pavilion. When he filed an official complaint, he discovered that the demon's uncle is Ao Shun, the Dragon King of the West, and thanks to nepotism, there's nothing he can do. He's such a small-time god, the Jade Emperor will never listen to him, so he's hoping maybe Monkey will be willing to take matters into his own hands and do a little vigilante justice? Monkey's like, A Dragon King? Oh, I've threatened all those guys before. BRB, I'll sort this out. And blasts off to the Western Ocean. He intercepts the messenger carrying the invitation to come meet Tripitaka, then marches up to the palace to have a little chat with the Western Dragon King. But while Monkey was expecting to have to throw some weight around or threaten the guy, as soon as the dragon sees the invite, he freaks out. See, the demon is his sister's ninth son and didn't have anywhere else to go, so the Dragon King advised him to travel to the Black River and train himself so he could be ready to take on some official position in the bureaucracy later. He had no idea his nephew attacked the river god, and he certainly doesn't condone eating Buddhists. The dragon calls up his son, Moang, and sends him off with an army to apprehend his cousin. So Moang and Monkey head back to the river, and Moang tells Monkey he'll take care of the demon so Monkey can just relax for a bit. Monkey and Sandy chill on the banks while Moang dives down to confront the demon. Moang and the demon argue about how much trouble he's in. The demon hasn't actually seen Monkey and doesn't realize how dangerous this group he's been antagonizing is, while Moang knows all about Monkey and the kind of damage he can do. Inevitably, the two of them fight, and Moang fakes out the demon before KOing him and taking him prison. Moang leads Monkey through the pavilion to retrieve Tripitaka and Pigsy, the Black River God is restored to his rightful place, and as thanks, he parts the waters so the gang can continue westward. And they do for a while, but as the crew makes their way, they suddenly hear this horrible sound, like hundreds of people screaming at the same time. While the rest of the gang debates what might have made the noise, Monkey flies up to see if he can spot it. Instead, he sees a beautiful city in the distance, and a small crew of very ragged-looking monks trying to pull a cart full of rocks up a hill near the gates. The monks are responsible for the noise, as they're all yelling in unison as they pull. Two Taoists come out of the city, and the monks all look terrified and start pulling harder, and Monkey realizes he's heard of this city. It must be the Slow Cart Kingdom, a place where Taoists are revered with the highest honors, and Buddhism is hated to the point of being criminalized. So Monkey disguises himself as a Taoist sage and pops down to chat up the Taoists and get a little info on this place. When he introduces himself and asks if there's a good spot in the city for him to beg some vegetarian food, like the good Taoist he is, the Taoists laugh and tell him that in this kingdom, the king himself is devoted to the Tao, and there will be no need for him to beg, it'd be an honor for the citizens to give him food. They tell Monkey that 20 years ago, the kingdom was ravaged by a terrible drought, and no amount of Buddhist prayer seemed to help. But then, just when things seemed hopeless, three Taoist immortals called Tiger Strength Immortal, Deer Strength Immortal, and Goat Strength Immortal descended from the sky, summoned the rain, and fixed the drought. The court retaliated against the Buddhists by demolishing their temples and enslaving all the monks, which is why the Buddhist monks are on rock-pulling duty while the Taoists are living large. So Monkey's like, oh, 
gosh, that's just horrible. I came to this city because a relative of mine became a Buddhist monk here. And the Taoists tell him that out of respect as a fellow Taoist, they'll let him take his relative if he's one of the monks they have. So Monkey sidles over to the monks to get their side of the story, though not before laughing at them for being lousy Buddhists. Real nice, Monkey. Anyway, the monks tearfully explain that not only did the Taoists enslave all the monks in the city, they enslave any monks that travel to the city, which will obviously be a problem for Tripitaka. Apparently, the Taoist immortals won the king over by arranging the construction of a temple where they can read scriptures and stuff that'll ensure the king lives for 10,000 years, and the king liked the idea so much that he lets them do whatever they want. Monkey asks why the monks don't just run away, and they explain that their faces are posted in every province in the kingdom as a preemptive measure to keep them in prison. They say even though their lives are hopeless and they'd rather die than keep living like this, they keep getting saved from death and visited in their dreams by a whole bunch of gods, telling them to stay alive because the great Tang monk is coming to save them and he's bringing the great sage equal to heaven. So Monkey heads back over to the Taoists and is all like, you know, it's the darndest thing. I'm actually related to all of these monks. So. Me and my cousins are just gonna go. And the Taoists obviously kick up a fuss, so Monkey gets cranky and kills them. The monks all freak out because they're gonna get blamed for the deaths, and Monkey's like, Would you guys relax? I'm the Great Sage. And the monks are like, No, you're not. The Gold Star of Venus told us that the Great Sage is all ugly and hairy with scary fangs and stuff. And Monkey's like, That mother... Hmm. Hmm. <clears throat> you got me. I'm not the Monkey King. I just work for him. And he's right behind you! So all the monks turn to look, and Monkey changes back and scares him. I'm not even joking. I love this book. So Monkey eats the card away and tells all the monks to scatter until they get word that the kingdom is safe for them. And he gives all the monks magical protection in the form of one of his hairs. Each hair can transform into a guardian thunder spirit for each individual monk. And with that sorted, most of the monks run off with their new magic bodyguards. Although about a dozen stay behind to help out Monkey and the gang. But Tripitaka's gotten tired of waiting, and in his biggest act of agency yet, has come to find Monkey himself. And Monkey fills him in on the situation. So the remaining monks sneak the gang into the last surviving monastery in the city and put them up for the night. But Monkey's too stressed out to sleep, so he decides to investigate the giant Taoist temple the three immortals had built. He finds the three immortals and a huge number of young Taoists playing music and praying, and he also notices a ton of delicious looking buns and food offerings and stuff. Remembering the age-old proverb, a single hand cannot clap, Monkey decides that it'll be much more fun to wreck this place with company, so he goes to wake up Sandy and Pigsy and asks if they want to help him prank the Taoists and steal their food. The gang whips up a whirlwind in the temple, and the Taoists take this as a sign to call it a night. To keep suspicion to a minimum, the trio transform to resemble three statues in the temple, with Pigsy disposing of the originals down the nearest toilet. Suitably disguised, the gang digs in. Although Monkey isn't actually a huge fan of cooked food, being a monkey, so he just has some fruit and hangs out with his friends. Oh, that's cute. But the party goes south when one of the young Taoists realizes he forgot his handbell and heads back into the hall, where he hears breathing, sees the place wrecked, freaks out and slips on a lychee seed, and Pigsy bursts out laughing. The Taoist runs away and returns with the three immortals, who see that the offerings have been eaten, but nobody's around. Around. The immortals conclude that the strength of their prayer must have brought the three pure ones down from heaven to take their offerings, and while they're here, they should ask for some golden elixir and holy water to give to the king. Monkey, as the statue, speaks up and tells the Taoists that they were indeed summoned by their super effective prayer, but they've just come from the festival of immortal peaches and they don't have any elixir or holy water on them right now, but they can come back tomorrow? But the Taoists are very insistent, so Monkey says they can get them some holy water, but they'll need a container and the Taoists will need to leave the room. After some reshuffling, they're left alone with a big cistern, and Pigsy's confused about where they're supposed to get the holy water from until Monkey starts peeing in it. So the trio accumulate an impressive amount of holy water, which the Taoists admit doesn't taste very good, and once they realize they've been bamboozled, Monkey grabs Pigsy and Sandy and blasts through the doors, slipping back into the monastery undetected for a good night's sleep. The next day, Tripitaka goes to the king to have his travel papers recertified, and because this kingdom likes enslaving monks, Monkey and the gang go with him to make sure nothing goes wrong. The king immediately goes to toss Tripitaka in prison, but his advisor privately tells him that these monks are from a really faraway kingdom, and to get here they must have gone through an absolute butt-ton of demons, so it's probably best not to mess with them. But just when it looks like this adventure might be over quickly, the three immortals swagger in and order the guards to apprehend our heroes for wreaking mischief in the Taoist temple. But Monkey says that that's ridiculous. They're new in town, they don't know anything about this city, so how on earth would they even know about the temple? And even if they did, how could they have done any real damage without these three super powerful Taoist immortals stopping them? This confuses the king enough that he can't tell who's the bad guy in the situation, but just then a messenger arrives to inform the king that an outlying village is suffering from a drought, and they've requested help from the immortals. The king has a bright idea and suggests they turn it into a competition. Whoever can make it rain is the winner and won't get in trouble. Monkey thinks this is a great idea, and the crew ships off to the town and gets to work. So Tiger Strength Immortal hops up on the podium and explains that he's going to strike his ritual tablet five times, and his first four strikes will summon the wind, clouds, lightning, and rain, while the fifth strike will dismiss the storm. So obviously, when Tiger Strength Immortal gets ready to do his thing, Monkey surreptitiously duplicates himself and vanishes into the clouds overhead to intercept whatever he does. With each strike on the tablet, the sage summons more and more 
minor gods, each with their own part to play in the creation of the storm. But as soon as they run into Monkey, they freak out, he explains the situation, and they all agree to help him out instead. So five strikes and exactly no rain later, Monkey pops back down, tells Tiger Strength Immortal to quit embarrassing himself, and hops up on the podium. Monkey pulls a nervous Tripitaka up on the stage and tells him to recite the Heart Sutra and he'll handle the rest. Tripitaka begins, and Monkey signals the gods overhead, and they unleash a truly biblical storm. Gale force winds, sheets of rain, the works. The king is thoroughly convinced, but the Taoists aren't done yet. They suggest that maybe the dragons they summoned were just late, and the storm was really their creation after all. So they successfully confuse the king again, but Monkey's like, Okay, well, tell you what. I haven't dismissed the dragons yet, so they're all chilling invisible overhead. If you guys can command one of them to appear, you can take the win. If not, I'll get him to show up, and we take the win. The king has never seen a dragon before and is very excited, and sure enough, the Taoists can't compel any of the dragons to show themselves, where it just takes a stern look from Monkey to get all four of them strutting their celestial stuff. But the Taoists aren't willing to give up so easily, and they convince the king to let them do one more competition to determine who's actually cool. This one, a meditation contest, where each participant will fly to the top of a tower and then meditate for a predetermined amount of time. This is actually a problem. Monkey can do a lot of things, but sitting still is not one of them. But Tripitaka can. During his monk training, he recalls meditating for years at a time, so this competition should be a snap for him. Monkey flies him up disguised as a cloud, and Tripitaka and the Goat Strength Immortal begin their meditation competition. But the Deer Strength Immortal decides to cheat to help out his fellow Taoist, and summons a bed bug to bite Tripitaka. Monkey notices Tripitaka's distress and flies up to investigate, removes the bug, gives Tripitaka a couple scritches, then turns himself into a centipede and bites Goat Strength Immortal on the face. Goat Strength Immortal flings himself off the tower in surprise, and Tripitaka wins. But if you thought the Immortals were gonna gracefully lose, think again. They have one more challenge for the crew, this one a clairvoyance thing. They ask the king to put some precious trinket in a sealed lacquer box and have them take turns trying to predict what it is. The king agrees and has his wife put some fancy clothes in the box, but Monkey turns into a tiny bug, sneaks into the box to take a peek, and transforms the clothes into really ratty bad clothes. The Taoists guess the fancy clothes, but with Monkey's guidance, Tripitaka guesses terrible clothes, and the king is just as shocked as the Taoists are to see that Tripitaka's right. They try a few more times, but Monkey just keeps faking them out, and finally, in frustration, the Immortals demand one final competition. See, they're not called Immortals for nothing. They all know how to survive having their heads cut off, their hearts removed, or being boiled in oil. So if the Buddhists can survive that, they'll accept the loss. Monkey is absolutely stoked at the opportunity to show off how indestructible he is, so he accepts the competition and demands to go first. The King has an execution site prepared, so they tie Monkey up and cut off his head. But there's no blood, and Monkey yells for his head to return. The Deer Immortal freaks out and orders two servant spirits to hold down the head and keep it from returning. Monkey tries two more times with no luck, so instead he hops up, breaks all the ropes, and grows a new head. The king is so impressed, he offers to give them their papers right now, but Monkey says he got his head cut off, so it's only fair the Immortals do so too. So Tiger Strength Immortal gets his head cut off, but when he calls for it to return, Monkey turns one of his hairs into a dog, which runs off with the head and drops it into the moat. Unable to simply grow a new head like Monkey, Tiger Strength Immortal dies and reverts to his true form, which is a yellow tiger. Not the biggest twist, I guess? Deer Strength Immortal is outraged and demands he try the heart removal thing. Monkey's excited because he's had a mild stomach ache and was hoping for the opportunity to clean out his spleen a little bit. One very graphic disembowelment later, Monkey's totally fine, but when the Deer Strength Immortal tries the same thing, Monkey turns one of his hairs into an eagle to straight up Prometheus this dude. Deer Strength Immortal dies for real and turns into a white deer. Starting to sense a pattern here. So the final immortal, Goat Strength Immortal, demands the boiled in oil thing, which Monkey is also enthused for, claiming his skin's been kinda dry lately and an oil bath might be just what he needs. So Monkey swims around in the boiling oil all happy-like, but when he sees Pigsy whispering something to Sandy, he thinks maybe he's laughing at him and decides to prank him back. So he turns into a tech, apparently disappearing, and they instantly declare him dead and capture his companions. Tripitaka asks for a moment to grieve his lost disciple and gives him a very sweet eulogy, calling Monkey gallant and wishing him peace. Pigsy ruins the moment by calling him an ignorant, deep fried Pima Wen, and Monkey is so pissed he turns back just to yell at him. The arresting officer freaks out and says he must be a ghost because otherwise he'd have made a false report by declaring him dead, and Monkey is so offended that he hauls himself out, dries himself off, gets all dressed up, and kills that guy for insinuating he might be dead. The king is all set to give him their papers and let him go, but Monkey insists the goat immortal take his turn in the tub. So he does, but Monkey is suspicious and tests the oil, finding it very cool to the touch. Monkey reasons a cold dragon must be keeping the fire from heating the oil and contacts the northern dragon king about it. The dragon king has the errand cold dragon arrested, and without that, the oil is, well, boiling. Goat Immortal dies and turns into a goat. The king is all sad about all his immortals dying, but Monkey reminds him that they were all demons in disguise, not really human, and they were probably plotting to take over his kingdom or kill him or something. The king is relieved, reverses his policy on Buddhism, and gives the gang their travel papers, so after that lengthy detour, they're all set to continue along their journey to the west. They've traveled far and done great things, but there's still a long way to go. What new trials await them on their arduous adventure? Find out next time on Journey to the West.